Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. We have a very special episode today. I'm speaking with a relative value uh, credit manager and investor and trader who's got some concerns about uh, the commercial real estate banking market in Germany. And he's got specifics on a one uh, specific bank, which is you know having some issues right now. I'm speaking with Josef Schorn, portfolio manager at Xia Investments. Josef, uh, welcome to Forward Guidance. Tell the audience just a little bit about your background and what you do as a relative value credit trader uh, at Xia. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me here. So I started my career out at RBC in London, which in the, the credit division, then moved over to a small uh, fund fund in Munich. And I'm now with Xia for a little bit more over two years. Um, so what do you do at uh, Xia is basically concentrate a lot on relative value credit. So between cash bonds and CDS, between different parts of the capital structure, between credit and equity. So that's what, what we are daily, daily doing. We are a very nimble firm, try to eliminate the negative convexity there and try to create some positive convexity within credit portfolios. So what we generally do is try to combine two instruments and therefore destroy this negative convexity. Let's say we had a convertible bond with CDS, we have hedged out the interest rate, rate, interest rate at a, the credit risk, and therefore only along the optionality of the convertible. That that will be one example. Th- th- thanks. Yeah. So convexity is like how much you're risking to how much you earn. So like owning a lottery ticket is probably the most positive convexity thing. You know, not that it has a positive expected return. And you know, that's the thing about owning a bond. If you get if the best scenario is you get paid. The worst scenario is it's a zero. So uh, interesting about convexity, and then CDS is, is credit default swap. So pretty advanced uh, financial instruments. Yosef, you emailed me, you know, one or two weeks ago about an ongoing issue in the German banking sector. What caused you to to write that email? And I should say, I said, okay, Yosef, very interesting. Can we do an interview in in March? And you said, no, things are moving pretty quickly. We should probably do this next week. So what caused you to write that email? What have you been observing with let's just call it the bank, a, a Deutsche Fund brief, also known as PBB. What is very interesting in the European credit market, in, in financial especially, is, is that generally the whole market trades very tight. So differentials between different part of the capital structure. So senior debt versus sub day trades at relatively compressed levels. So if you look like, let's say, at an Italian lender, in Disa San Paolo, um, I mean that the differential trades now at, at um, 84, while I mean that at the historical tides while last year they were let's say trading at 250 where during the during the banking crisis in the US similarly case similar case with commerzbank also trades trades very tight and also banks are performing relatively well as a whole but within that you do see extreme weakness uh, within two banks in Germany which have a lot of concentration in commercial real estate you have Deutsche Fundbrief Bank and Areal Bank. Both are like lenders with each around 50 billion. Both have around 30 billion in, in loans. I mean, if you, if you look at both lenders, they do are active in the commercial real estate market, while PBB is much more active in, in the German market. They are much more after low margin lending. On, and Areal, on the other hand, is much more spe- specialized lender. So the loans are much more drawn out. So they're also very active in, in the U.S. and also therefore relatively exposed to the U.S. CAE market, something you wouldn't expect from, let's say, a typical German lender. And so Ariel Bank is uh, not publicly traded. It was taken private. Fond Brief Bank, PBB, is publicly traded uh, on, the I think, the German stock exchange. What is it about these two banks that have a, they have a heightened risk profile? Because I imagine a lot of banks whether in Germany, wherever, have a lot of commercial real estate loans. What is it about these two banks where the, the risk, you know, in your, in your view and in the view of some market participants is higher? So in general, if you just look at basically where, where things trade, and I think first we have to look at basically how the capital structure in European banks is set up. So you're at the very bottom, you have like your equity, 
Then on top of that, you have like your AT1s, so your additional tier one, then tier two, then non-preferred senior, which could be also bailed, bailed in, in case of, of a bankruptcy or a resolution event. And on top of that, preferred senior deposits and on top of that covered bonds. So it's a relatively complex um, capital structure and probably also different compared to banks in the US with like a balance sheet size of, of 50 million. And what you do see that is 81s for PBB trade at 20 cents on the dollar. So they do indicate a certain degree of, of distress. Also like the tier two in the, in the 30s and the non-preferred senior in like the, the 40s. So the additional tier one, say, which is senior to the equity is trading at 20 cents on the dollar. How come the stock is only down? I mean, it's down from what, 10 to th- three. But I feel like if, if that's true, it should be down more, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, like, it's still a 500 million stock, right? Trades at a price to book for, of, um, of like 0.16. So that also prices in a relatively high degree of, um, of default. I mean, what you usually see, um, and that is not exclusive to banks, is that you, usually you have like your equity reaction, equity comes down and and then basically credit hits you harder in the face than equity does. So you have an um, credit underperformance because credit anticipates it. And then at the end, um, equity catches up. It's, okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I know just from looking at the American bank preferred market where it's priced in $25, not 100, the lowest it got intraday for some banks was, I mean, the, for the banks that failed, it obviously went to zero, but uh, was like $8, which is times four, 30, you know, 30, $32. So 20, yeah, $20 on a bond is, is pretty low. Yeah. Especially, I mean, considering that other parts of the AT1 um, market are very hot. I mean, you've seen a lot of issues in the AT1 market. They have prefer- performing extremely well, especially since last November, when the market generally turned up as a whole. So what is unique about these banks? Let's talk about P- PBB, Pond Brief. Yeah. Th- their commercial real estate risk. I imagine there are a lot of German banks that, you know, have loans against apartment buildings, offices. Why Pond Brief? Yeah, I mean, like the, the big issue is that they are solely um, CAE lenders. So their whole loan book is basically CAE. And that's the same for a Real Bank as it is for a Deutsche Pond Bank. And that also, I mean, if you just look at, at the US CIE exposure for a real bank in this case, that's like 8.6 billion out of a $32 billion book. So that's pretty, pretty big. Same for like, if you just look at the office exposure, that's like 4.6 billion. And that's like much larger than their CET ones or like the equity they have. So that's like the concerns people have. And which could be warranted given where AT1s trade. If you look at fund free banks, they're a bit smaller in, in, in the US, but their US book is 80% offices. And that makes them relatively concentrated towards, um, towards risk at the CAE market, and especially the, the US office market. And other U, uh, German lenders are not exposed to the US often works to, to the same degree, but like similarly to the to European um, CAE market. Yes, 80% office of a CRE portfolio is, I would say anecdotally huge. Uh, a lot of banks that, oh my God, their commercial real estate exposure is so large. It's typically like 15 to 30% office, I would say, in some cases less. So yeah, 80% office is, is very large. That's only only like the the U.S. part. So in other parts, they are more diversified. That's for sure. But that's generally true. I mean that the thing is, I would say um, with U.S. Or, or general, like with the with the book concentration, that Ariel was always perceived as a very um, very good lender. Also came out very well through the 2008 2009 crisis. And seems to have a, like a strong workout group, have been very capitalized. And last year there was like um, a buyout where, where fund put in like 2 billion to, to, to buy them out. So they have a strong software product. I mean, like are well respected. So there is like, they are not uh, per se like a bad or reckless lender. So that's, I think the, just the wrong 
or something which is more like that they are exposed very much to a certain sector which dramatically underperforms and i think that's that's the takeaway how bad is the commercial real estate situation in germany and, and how when it compared to the us i feel like i mean you people have been telling me or people i've been listening to people talk about how commercial real estate is weak for nearly four years so it's it's a very slow moving crisis or, or if it is a crisis i'm not saying it is and i i might ask you to explain why we, you want to do this interview on thursday february 22nd instead of early march like why is this moving you think moving so quickly as opposed to let's say okay yeah maybe the investment returns of those loans won't be great but similar to a private equity situation like no one's going to figure out how bad it is until year maybe two years maybe three years later and you know things can be worked out my two cents here is what you have seen is that like very many developers have defaulted pvb's share to developers is it's 10 percent of the loan book and to mo- many of them they have exposure and you've also seen like a very large um, default last year with the signa group which was like 27 billion in in assets where a lot of German savings bank insurers are already like hit. Is that Rene Banco? Exactly, that's Rene Banco, yeah. T- tell, tell the audience about who, who's that. So that's an Austrian self-made billionaire who started, I think, in 1997. And from that built it basically an empire, a huge real estate empire. I mean, he, he even owns parts of the Chrysler building and two Austrian newspapers just to allow for some diversification. And last year, basically, he didn't, he wasn't able to secure enough funds to keep like the machine going and then had to file for insolvency. Now everything slowly unravels. And um, I mean, there were like some, some bonds on, on some of this uh, development projects. So they are like now quoted in the, in their teens. So you do have like significant, um, significant default risk. And you, the issue as well is that the structure is extremely complex. So it's also very tough to, to really get a hold of, of the situation. And I don't think that's uh, it's existential for the CME market in general and also not for the banking market. But like you do need like capacities to take care of, of unraveling it. It's similar like if you have a, a workout of like too many MPLs, it just needs time and capacity. And that's one thing. And apart from that, you do have just very many developers defaulting. And the issue there is relatively simple. That just uh, the increase in rates have pushed them out of the money. So let's say you, you have a, a building which is worth, let's say, 100 million and this has like a 3% cap rate. That's not unnatural for US off, uh, for office in Germany. And you just go from 100 to 75, it's like, 100 percent in um, 100 pips increase in cap rates what do you mean 175 you have like a building valued at 100 oh, yeah at like a three percent cap rate and now you go to a four percent cap rate which is not outrageously right and now you go to 75 but if you have like conservatively financed your building let's say with a 60 percent ltv you're basically down uh, 25 uh, million on your investment so that's just a very, very, very simple example. And now it comes a bit down how the, the rest of the, the financing works. So let's say you have put in like 40 million equity, 60 million debt. Now you're down to 75. And now you need, or you don't need, but probably the, the lender is interested in keeping um, a stable loan to value ratio. Loan to value should stay at 60. Very, very simple. So, but what, what does this imply? You're not taking out. So usually in the last 10 years, rates have gone down and basically uh, values have gone up. So each time you refinance the building, you could take out equity. But this time you need to put in equity just to keep the trade going. And the thing is, if if basically the, the loss on the uh, like the, the loss on the property is high enough to put the um, equity investor out of the money, he's less inclined to put money in. So that's what we also heard from Ariel when they told me about some of the lenders in the US and what we also see from like developers in Europe, that like the increase in rates and basically the fall in, uh, fall in valuations, 
was so rapid that you put a lot of, of equity investors out of the money. And if you're out of the money, you're less inclined to put new money in to stabilize your investment. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you can lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. So when you look at Fond Brief Bank in particular, PBB, people are worried about the losses, but have they have they taken some credit reserves? Because you know, the, when when a bank takes a reserve takes a loss is very different from when the loss you know may appear economically. So on, if you look at its balance sheet, has the credit quality deterioration that that may be there has that been realized yet, or how how, how far along is that process? They did recognize some MPLs, and they're also provisioned to some extent for it, but. For example, like there's also a hedge fund, Peters Advisors, who was before an investor in PBB, sold his position, I think now even short. And he also expressed his concern that the bank um, under provisions. What I've heard also from, from Areal Bank is also that they provision more than, let's say, PBB. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did see that article from Re uh, Reuters that an investor in Profound Reef Bank not only sold his position, but actually shortened it, sh uh, shorted the stock, which is... Pretty, pretty incredible story. Okay, so that's the asset side. Tell us about the liability side. Can there be sort of a run on the bank of Fund Brief Bank as there was for Silicon Valley Bank? Or are the liabilities more longer term, in which case, even if the assets are bad, you know, it's hard for there to be a, a run on the bank? Yes, I think what, what Deutsche Fund Brief Bank and also Areal Bank did very well is um, that they basically lured in a lot of retail investors to provide them with term deposits. So you do have um, a relatively large share of their, their, their deposits in the form of, um, of term deposits, and that definitely helps them. So they don't have any, any, um, any funding need for the next six months. And they were even able to, to place Schulzschein, uh, like a covered bond, um, earlier this year. They weren't able. Uh, they were able, they, they were, were able, able. To, to, they were able to, to place a covered bond. For the next six months, the situation does look okay. The, the thing is like you can be solvent and like your assets are, are higher than your liabilities. But th the question is always, when does the regulator step in? And we have seen it in the, the case of Credit Suisse last year, uh, where the scars are still very fresh, that even though the bank might not be insolvent, the regulator is coming after you just because there, there is generally a, a negative sentiment from the market and also not really investor appetite to, um, to finance the, the bank going forward. The, their liability structure is of their deposits. A lot of them are term deposits. There are some overnight deposits, but, but not a lot. So, so term deposits in America known as CDs. Uh, so, you know, that bank has that money for a certain amount of time and customers can't withdraw it. Although I think in the U.S., you can withdraw. There's just a penalty, so no one does. But I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if you know if a push comes to shove, if how that might work out. But then a ton of the liabilities of the bank, of Deutsche Fondbrief Bank, also known as PBB, a ton of their liabilities are Fondbriefs, so also known as covered bonds. So they're called Deutsche Fondbrief, but they also issue Fondbriefs. What is the covered bond Fondbrief market? So tell us about the history of that as well as the structure. Fondbriefs are one of the biggest foundations of basically the, the German and European um, financial system. So they were developed in the, in the um, 1800s in Prussia and have since then served as a like refinancing tool for banks. And since then, there was never a default on a fund brief. Um, so it's a very safe tool to refinance and utterly important for, for like refinancing banks in Europe. How it works is basically you have a certain amount of loans. Usually, CAE loans can be can be or uh, yeah, mortgages can be used in the, uh, for um, for bond brief. They go into a cover pool, 
and then a certain um, amount of of these of the cover pool can be issued in the form of of fund briefs or covers, and this makes them as they have let's say a LTV of around thirty to forty percent an extremely safe form. So other banks invest in it, insurance inv have invested in the past, um, so it's a very safe tool and also is relatively capital efficient tool for banks to have them as an asset. When you say capital efficient, what do you mean? So usually if you um, have an asset on, on your balance sheet as a bank, um, it comes at a cost, right? So let's say treasuries or government securities are cheaper than let's say high yield bonds. They have a low risk weighting. Exactly, exactly. Got it. So they can hold a lot of them and they don't have to hold yeah. equity risk capital against them. Okay, got it. So a, a fund brief has never failed. Yeah. What's your expectation about the fund briefs issued by PBB? So the thing is that um, at the moment, the fund briefs of PBB and Arial always came at like mid swaps flat around that. What does that mean? Say that again. What? They came at like mid swaps flat. So they could issue at, at mid swaps plus zero. That, that's basically the, the swap rate. So if you have 10 year swaps that trade at, at close to 3% in, in Europe now, then they basically can issue at around that level. That's just how you would uh, would basically trade or how you would. So uh, very narrow spread. Way. Exactly. Extremely narrow spread. And usually they could also like finance themselves at like in the preferred senior market also at 50 bips over, over swaps. So that was a very comfortable funding situation. And now basically this funding situation has, has changed. So they now have to, to pay mid swaps plus ADO, at least that's where they trade. They have said they could issue there and probably also investors would be inclined to buy them because it's a very attractive yield for a fund price if you get 80 bips over, over swaps. Similarly, if you look at like the preferred senior situation, that trades at, at now, I think, 500 bips in, in spread. And that's just not reliable. So if you, if you make loans at, in, in the case of fund bump of 150 plus 200 over, and you basically, your, your funding cost is so much elevated, you basically have a negative net interest margin, um, which makes it very tough to sustain that over, over, um, over the long run. So their cost of funds is approaching their, what they're earning on their loans. Currently, it's, it's higher than that. So that makes it very, very tough to keep going. And uh, I think that's also a very, very relevant topic going forward. If you do print like expensive paper and um, like put on like expensive term funding, like from, from, from term deposits, that makes it also very punitive to be taken over because somebody else has to uh, take on these liabilities, which, which come at a cost. So let's say if you could fund yourself like very, very cheaply, I don't have to pay anything for deposits. And now you buy somebody who has like very expensive deposits and what they printed were like in the very long range. So they printed five to 10 year deposits, which were good for them because like they could term out funding, but at a cost, right? Do you or your firm, you know, your relative value credit trader, do you have a position in any of these banks? I mean, w w have you evaluated the trade? Like, let's go long a credit instrument of PBB, Fund Brief Banks, you know, either the secured bonds or the AT1 bonds that are trading at 20 cents, and let's short the stock or something like that. Uh, have you evaluated that trade? And are you, are you in it or, or not? And why? Yeah, so we have looked at it, but the, the issue is with um, especially very small, sm small, um, small cap equities that you can't really short them. And it's all like, it's very tough to short them. And what we usually like to do is usually we try to buy puts because that has a very limited downside risk. I mean, look, you, <clears throat> if you have puts, you know what, what your downside is basically, that's what you paid for your puts, but you can't get short squeezed. And that's a big advantage in what we, what we really like. So in, in the case of PV and also Ariel, Ariel goods was taken private. But there's nobody selling puts there. Um, and this is also the case over the last year. So we were always looking at like doing the trade AG1 versus puts because this was like a great uh, trade last year. 
So after like Credit um, Suisse um, was taken over by UBS, 81s got extremely cheap. And you could basically hedge the full um, default risk by buying puts. So you basically then were long 81s and like just paid very little, let's say three, 3% running for your, like your put hedge, but could benefit from the whole upside and also um, enjoy some, some carry. And that, for example, worked relatively well. So we were also inclined to set it up similarly for, for Deutsche Bank, but, but unfortunately the liquidity is just not there in the option market. For PBB, so you, you can't buy puts. What do, what do you think about the credit instruments though, that just themselves? Obviously, you know, your relative value, so you're, you're not going to take a pure long position and not have a short against it. But how would you evaluate the credit of those AT1s selling at 20 cents? So what, what's always very interesting is that the AT1s <clears throat> can be either written down to zero or can also convert it into equity. And the issue with that is that if you are um, a credit manager, you, to some extent, you can't buy those securities because they could be converted into equity. So if they have this equity conversion feature, you can't buy them in your funds. So that would make it relatively tough for some investors to buy AT1s. Whereas the next layer, um, the T2s can be bought by pretty much everybody as, as long as the, is the rating good enough. So you usually you always have this mispricing between AT1 and tier twos. And if you look at that last bail-in experience, this was Banco Popular in, I think, 2017. Um, back then, what they did is they bailed in tier, two, uh, tier 81s, they bailed in tier twos, and then they sold it for like one, one euro to Banco Santander. And what they do so at the moment is that there is still a gap between 81s and tier twos. And from our experience, could be very well the case that both parts get would get bailed in in a recovery case. And then you would basically make money if you are long AG ones and short tier twos. That would be an a trade which you could set up. Bail in means if um this bank's bank needs to get resolved. So the regulator basically decides that um the bank is no longer viable and should be transformed into a different vehicle, if you may put it like that, then it could, uh, then that, that would lead to um, a resolution. So what we also had like with like Credit Suisse or with other banks, the usual way is, is that you put a bank to resolution. There you have various ways how to resolve a bank. So you could sell parts of it, put it into a um, transitional entity. Um, you could also sell it to, a, to another bank. Or what, what's the, the best way um, is basically if you bail in some parts of the capital structure. So, and that will be then first equity, then second 81s, third tier twos, and then non-preferred senior. And even if that's not enough, then you would also look to bail in preferred senior and um, deposits. But the non-preferred senior part of the capital structure was created to allow for a better bail in and basically avoid the issue that you have um, that you have if deposits are at stake. I think that the three bank failures last year were extremely costly for the American taxpayer. And at least these costs could have been avoided if there would have been um, enough capital in the form of, of uh, preferred senior debt. And I, th and there is also, um, I think, um, uh, initiative to introduce that as well, like for smaller U smaller US banks, still extremely large, but I mean, not GSIP, so global systemically important banks, because they do have already these, these capital buffers. Sorry to interrupt. Just want to tell you about BlockWorks' upcoming crypto symposium in London, the Digital Asset Summit, which is running from March 18th to March 20th. Everyone in crypto is going to be there, not just the experts and policymakers, but the real industry leaders writing the checks. Over $800 billion in assets is going to be represented. Anyone who's anyone in crypto is going to be there. So if you're into crypto and you haven't bought your ticket yet, the time is now to get your ticket. I would not wait any longer. We've got some exciting guests on the macro side too. Julian Brigden, Michael Howell. And yes, I can confirm at last the rumors are true. 
Joseph Wang, the Fed guy himself, is going to be there too. I'll be hosting a panel with these macro heavyweights that you don't want to miss, so be there or be square. Click the link in the description and use code FG10 to get 10% off. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Thanks for that. So, so Joseph, how do you think this plays out with Deutsche Fondry Bank? What, what's your kind of base case? At the moment, the market assigns a high probability to at least um, Deutsche Fondry Bank getting resolved or getting bailed in just what like market prices do indicate. And you have seen over the last week or so, you have also a similar movement um, with the 81s of, um, of RAL Bank. The issue generally is that it would be a problem generally to, to bail them in because that would signal the whole market that there is an issue with commercial real estate. If you put, and I think that's, that's the important message, you do have like, Two lenders which did CAE lending, but at a relatively conservative side. They were not much more aggressive than others. They also lend at 60% ATV, which also others, others did. But if you say, hey, we have a problem with like two banks, which did 60% ATV lending, and we now need to bail them in, that would definitely signal that there are like larger issues Within the, um, within the CAE market. And it could also signal because um, in Germany, there are also like the, the Landes banks and also like the savings banks. And they're also relatively large in, in CAE lending. And they could also like lead to, um, to ripple effects. I'm not saying that it, it's, it's getting system, systemic, but what it would or it could lead to Questions getting asked, how is this resolved? Who is taking it over? Who is paying for it? And if that happens, you would probably see some spread widening also for the, the larger German bank, so Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank. Bank. That would probably be the base case because like the, 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 if, even if it probably wouldn't make sense to make a lender like Deutsche Bank or like enlarge it with like two failed uh, property banks because like you just make con like concentration even even larger. There will be a question asked. So so you see a path of that it wouldn't fail. So what would that entail? Because uh, like not a bail in or not a takeover. You think it, you think there's a chance it makes it? It's um, very tough uh, where where spreads and where where like bonds trade at the moment just because like of the. Uh, self-fulfilling prophecy even though it, it looks for the moment to be overdone but just like the future is getting pulled towards towards now yeah what also is very interesting for a lot of your um, listeners is that in the past there were like in in europe there were like banks which had a lot of mpls on their books right i like the greek banks 50 percent, italian banks 15 spanish banks 15 and they got time to work out out of that and basically through the introduction of all these resolution mechanisms and, um, and uh, increased fungibility of, of deposits, you basically increase basic or, or decrease the, the time between like there is an issue and this bank getting resolved. So basically as with, with credits was very similar. They didn't have the asset situation. But as soon as you have your target on your back, you are basically gone and... The issue is that we are more and more looking at a bank like a utility, while it does have much more negative repercussions as a as a utility if it fails, right? Because like it's as a central um, credit channel, it's banks are so important, simply. So I think that's that's a very um, interesting angle that basically that there doesn't seem to be a, a business model which allows banks. Um, there's no business model which basically banks on trust over time. So if you say, hey, I'm, I'm having these credit losses, but I'm going to work out of them, the market is simply not giving you the time because the wholesale market is saying, no, I don't want to fund that. And the depositors are saying, no, I, I, can, um, I can have my money somewhere else. I mean, like Greek depositors or Italian or Spanish depositors just stayed with the banks, even though they were like burdened with MPLs. Why did those uh, Greek and Italian Spanish depositors stay with the banks as opposed to 
German banks now, what's the difference? First of all, I think that like the, the, the inclusion of a BRD, so how banks are getting resolved, that was all made stricter and also led to a kind of more safe banking space. But if you have like things happening, like at the moment with like real estate, where you have or could have um, asset losses piling up relatively quickly, if your the regulation, which is very well intended, doesn't really doesn't really help. But also a good thing about uh, Platinum Bank is their liability structure is is termed out, so they would have time to work things out. In other words, with Silicon Valley Bank, even though th there was no credit risk issue, like the assets they, they owned, it wasn't that they were going to get paid back. They you know, that lost a lot of in terms of interest rate risk. And they were technically insolvent, if you include those losses. But there was a bank run. It was all pulled out overnight. And that's the thing about banking is like you have a liability that you know, banks lend short and uh, sorry, borrow short and lend long is actually not true because generally liability structure of deposits is very long except it has an option value that can be one day. So you think it has liability, a uh, duration of 30 years, and it has a duration of one year, one day. But with Deutsche Fondbrief Bank, I mean, they've issued all of this bear bond paper in the Fondbrief market, and they have the long-term thing. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. Deutsche Fondbrief Bank has uh, done a terrific job in basically getting deposits in and term deposits and basically ensuring that, uh, that the bank stays liquid over the over the next couple of months. And the bigger issue in general is that as soon, and we have seen that with Credit Suisse last year and also like with Silicon Valley Bank and uh, First Republic, where here that the problems with Americans were probably a bit more severe, that as soon as you have your target on your back, you are basically gone. And that was different um, a decade ago, when you also had, like in Europe, a lot of banks which were loaded with MPLs. So you had the, the Greek ones with like 50% MPLs, um, Italian, Spanish with 15% uh, ones, and there were no bank runs. The thing which I think is, is important to notice here that while the, the, um, the regulatory changes were all very well intended and led to probably a safer or at least safer regarded banking system. The issue with ups and downs in banks where you have like credit losses at some point, these like ups and downs can't be really endured because if you only a depositor at a bank and you go shopping for deposits and are not really a, a client of a bank, then you just go somewhere else and take your deposits with you overnight. Wholesale deposits. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's wholesale funding and retail deposits. Mm -hmm. And the thing is probably very similar. If, if you're, um, at, let's say, a credit fund manager and you do have an exposure to drive with Fund Brief Bank and it's very small in your portfolio, why do you want to hold on to something um, which is relatively small in your portfolio? You don't really know what's going on. Similarly, if you are um, a retail, uh, have retail deposits with the bank, you're also... You only went there for an attractive yield on your deposits. But if you do get a similar yield on your deposits with less perceived risk or less real risk, why not go with somewhere else? And similar, if you look at the asset side, all the loans are on SPVs. All those are like with big funds. So you don't really have a, a connection between like the, the guys you do the loans with and like basically the guys who have the um, liability or the deposit mm. with you. I assume that's different for some of the US regional banks. And I also personally believe that would change generally something, even though it's probably very, very dreamlike, that you do see something similar with like European banks or, or banks in, in general. Because if there's more trust and grind between the asset and liability side, you do definitely decrease the risk of a bank run. Obviously, probably the sentiment has definitely changed over the last 10 years with like internet banking, everything at your fingertips. I mean, like it's so fast to pull money out. And I think that's has been shown last year um, and probably will be also shown in the in the future. Right. You're you're saying that the loans that Deutsche Foundry makes to real estate developers, those developers are not necessarily holding that money as a deposit in the bank. So it's not a relationship bank. They're funding it in the 
wholesale market, fund reef market, or capital markets. Sometimes you know, in America, we call it broker deposits, but that kind of, it's kind of different. And those customers might not be loyal. So, but th there is a positive that they do have a longer duration that are fixed. So do you know, so Deutsche Property, if you own a fund reef that you want to get, I guess you can sell that fund reef, but if you own a term CD or a term deposit, can you withdraw it or no? I'm not 100% sure, to be brutally honest. I do know that there is, I think, in the interbank lending market, there is usually like something like a break fee or something. So you could get money also um, back, but I don't know if that's also the case in the in the in the retail deposit market. Got it. Thank you. And, and then, uh, what about insurance? So in America, uh, we, FDIC insurance is above a quarter million dollars. You raised, I think, during the great financial crisis when Silicon Valley Bank failed. All un, all uninsured deposits were uh, made whole. That was kind of a special circumstance. What is the deposit insurance scheme like in Germany? And how exposed are people who would be above a deposit threshold? Yeah, so there is in general um, a deposit scheme at like the um, federal level. So that's up to 100,000 um, euros. And there is in addition um, like some form of support scheme um, across the private banks, but also like the savings banks and the Landesbanken. So they also have a support uh, mechanism. So let's say if a smaller, smaller savings bank fails, there is a support mechanism from first the nearby uh, savings banks. Then let's say the savings bank from, um, from the federal district. And though so that, that increases so that at some point, basically the whole savings bank and Landesbanken system supports that one bank. Similarly with the, the, the private banks where Deutsche Fundbrief would also be a part of or Commerzbank or Deutsche, um, they have also a similar mechanism um, where they also support each other. And that could also be an issue in, in um, resolution. So if, if there is are like doubts about the future um, of like Deutsche Fundbrief Bank and there could uh, be the decision made by, by Barfin, okay, we need to bail that in or resolve that bank. And the question is, where do you put that bank and where and who is going to pay for it? Because there could be this, the case that you also need some um, support from, from the deposit scheme. And then the question is, okay, if I'm, let's say LBBW, that's the Landesbank of Swabia, they also have um, real estate exposure. They are saying, okay, I also have like exposure. Why should I take over a bank which which has even more exposure and even pay with my capital? And it comes at the same time when banks generally are pulling back on lending, being more restrictive, and also need to preserve capital and liquidity. Right. And so so Bafin is the German financial regulatory authority. Uh, yes. Earlier you said um, S. What was it called? SPV special purpose vehicle. They do some off balance sheet stuff, and then. Not NPL is non-performing loans. Okay, so so Joseph, I'm going to ask the question in a much more positive way. Okay, so 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 Joseph, so there is a scenario of Deutsche Fund Reef Bank uh, failing, being bailed in, taken over by regulators. You know, we're aware of that. That can happen to to, to any bank. Uh, it's just a it's just the nature of the business. If if there is a good outcome in terms of Deutsche, you know, Deutsche's Fund Reef Bank in two years, it still exists. The stock is still publicly traded and it's still going strong. You know, maybe not strong, but it's still, it's still out there. What is that silver lining scenario? How could you see this, you know, not going the bail-in resolution route? So I think, which is definitely um, positive at the moment, that generally like the market backdrop in credit is very strong. You do see that like new issues are oversubscribed. So generally the market backdrop is, is good. If you would see also lower rates, that would definitely um, help on the, on the funding side as well as on the valuation side for, for buildings. And that holds especially true for, let's say, development. Because obviously the CIE market in the US also, I mean, has this structural problem, which also has some rate aspect to it. I mean, like valuation or like lower rates do help, but it is still a structural problem. Um, so that will definitely help. Um, and in addition, what also um, would be would be um, beneficial if we do generally see a bid for CAE to come back. 
So what we've heard from Ariel Bank is that they have an NPL, so they said this on the Q3 call last year. They have a US office here, e-building, which is or was worth valued at 150 million. They have a loan 90 million, but the bid for that loan, if they would like to sell it, is like at 50. And that basically implies that it would take like close to a 50% haircut on that loan. And the issue with, with that generally is you need a more supportive backdrop for, for CIE in general. Um, you need more transactions. You need more, generally a better um, market environment for the asset class. And that would definitely help because like that, the, the more uncertainty you have in that asset class, the also the bigger the discounts are generally. Right. And going back to our first point about uh, convexity, what, if you, you know, there, there are office real estate investment trusts in the US, which were trading at distressed levels a, a, one year ago. And if you bought them, there's a chance the REIT could double. But I guess the, the issue with office loans as opposed to office buildings is that the best you're going to get is par. So you have to buy them at a dis distressed value if you want to. But you said the AT1, uh, additional tier one bonds were trading at 20 cents on the dollar. I mean, does that imply that the market thinks there's an 80% chance that you know, the bank is going to fail or be taken over? And like, if you think that there's only a 60% chance that it's going to fail, you might, you know, buy it and you're, uh, Real risk adjusted value is is a hundred percent, right? That's uh, absolutely correct. But at the moment, I think there's a decent chance that the market assesses this correctly. But I think another another uh, thing you just mentioned are like the mortgage reads in the U.S. Right? You had very recently Carson Block on the podcast. Yep. And um, I mean, he also mentioned a couple of very interesting details, which he also checked and also looked at at at, at the trade in general. And I mean, like what, what he said was that you do have a lot of, of um, interest rate caps and interest rate swaps coming off this year. So I think that's also a very interesting thing to notice that you will have also for like the, the, the banks and also the mortgage reads, they will see like, uh, or, or the asset owners will do see like higher, higher interest rates go going forward. And this would probably also be felt with a lag by like banks and mortgage reads. And I think what's also a very interesting analogy between the covers and like the mortgage reads is that also mortgage reads do have at the very top of the capital structure, some of the um, loans packaged in some form of collateralization with banks. Mm -hmm. So I think that is also an, an interesting analogy between, between both because what is generally interesting with, with um, let's say, cupboards and also like this collateralization with mortgage trusts, that the more value gets drawn in into this collateralization, that reduces generally the collateral uh, the, the recovery for more junior investors in the case of an insolvency. Right. Yeah. And so earlier when I talked about REITs, I, in my mind, instruments that had positive convexity, I was thinking of properties that own the actual buildings and our borrowers. You talked about mortgage REITs, which uh, credit rates, so they basically own loans. So it's kind of similar to a bank, but it's not a bank. And they, yeah, collaborate with CLOs. And that's another issue about everyone can wax, you know, doom and gloom about CLOs. But I think the reality is that the structure of a lot of CLO is they issue seven-year debt, they issue 10-year debt. And, you know, like the things of, of Fond Brief Bank, that, that money is, you know, theirs to play with for seven years and it can't be pulled. So it, it sounds like there are many negatives of Palm Reef Bank, but the one perhaps uh, silver lining I would say is that they, again, it has those longer duration liabilities. So, so if it has a longer duration liabilities, but uh, you know, do you think it's more, more likely that a regular steps in th than if it just kind of goes through by itself where it, it's losing money, you know what I'm saying? And it, it, it can't refinance itself? What you just said is that um, a bank basically becomes insolvent. I don't remember the last time this has, has really happened. Where you really have an issue where your, your liabilities are larger than your assets just because you have so lo lost so much money. So usually that um, um, regulator is much more quicker in, in stepping in and then resolving the bank. Just because there are also ripple effects. They want to preserve like the funding channel in that in the term or in the case of a CAE bank 
um also like you also have like issues if if the tension stays too high and you also have like ripple effects on on other banks and generally like sentiment doesn't improve unless you um resolve the situation remember also last year um when cs uh, went under there were also like big scrutiny about deutsche bank mm -hmm. and for no reason just because like if you do see let's say in the case of a deutsche Bank, bank you do see like issues coming up at deutsche Bank, bank you instantly say okay what does deutsche Bank bank has on its book it has a lot of real estate loans and you look around who has also real estate loans on its book and even if they are like slightly different you always um, make inference between the Chipampi Bank and a similar bank or like with, with assets on that, on, on, on the balance sheet. So that's a thing I would argue uh, um, a regulator tries to, uh, tries to avoid. Got it. And how would you assess the prospects of the other bank that's private, not publicly traded, opposed to Fondry Bank? Would you say its prospects are better or, or less good? It has a different profile, given that it's much more diversified, but also like more exposure through the years. It seems also that they are, um, let's say, a bit more sp uh, specialized lender than Deutsche Pfandpreis, given that, for example, like they have a very large share in in lending towards hotels. So they do like 30, uh, one third of their, their um, loan book is towards hotels. But the general thing is that they do have a bit more um, deposits which are on site, which could be pulled out. So that's the, that's the bigger issue. They also benefited like um, last year from that. So when generally like rates increased and basically also like their, their, their margins on their loans, they could reprice loans. So basically their, their, net, uh, their income increased. And they didn't need to um, pay up for their deposit because their deposit stayed relatively low. So they earned an extra income there. So their net income last year was also um, relatively stable. Um, but that could be a drawback going forward. Very interesting. Josef, thank you so much for coming on Forward Guidance and uh, yeah. share, sharing your knowledge with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.